All right, Mike, are you going to share the joke? We have to wait. Uh, the joke is I'll send it out so that everyone can see it in the future. But Chrisman on his April 1st spoof one did a little segment on all the acronyms within our industry. And we have a very talented person within our company. His name is Jason, and he heads up a little social media company now. And he did a whole video working with me. Poor guy probably came over like 10 times of, okay, what's this acronym? What's this acronym? What's this acronym? So that he could figure out how to string them all in sentences. And then he's a freestyle rapper. So we figured out how to do this very fast cadence. So Rob listened to it. So it's about a two minute long conversation with as many acronyms as you can possibly fit from our industry and it just kind of life. No it's idea how I missed this. I'm going to have to go look for it now. <laughs> Uh, you awesome. don't need to look too far. It's on a private YouTube, but we do have a public version that we'll send. Well, Mr. Chrisman will uh, have, and he can share. I love it. That's fantastic. Yeah. Right. Well, while we're letting everybody in, um, any final four predictions? For the women? No. Are we done? Is it NC? Oh, Lord. No, men. No, you've lost me. You've oh. gone out of acronyms and into sports. Yeah. Uh, Rob, aren't you a basketball person? I play. I don't I, okay. I couldn't. Is, Thank is, you, Femi. Femi NC State, one of, one of, NC State, one of the final four teams. Okay, we got Alabama. We got Purdue, NC State, and UConn. Nothing. Yeah. All right, Bueller. I just, I, I thought for sure this was going to be something we could have a good conversation about. <laughs> uh, I, I follow the Warriors, and I, they, I think they, they beat the Houston Rockets uh, last night, and that has guaranteed their place in the play-in. My how, how the Warriors have fallen from a few years ago when they were, you know, on fire. But that's all right. We digress. We should. All right. We should launch the mic because we have a lot. Once the of Wildcats are out, I quit watching. So it's it's dead to me. All right. Well, I'm I UConn. I see in the chat. I see NC State. I think UConn and NC State um, are going to be in the uh, in the final round. So we'll see. UConn seems to be oh, winning in the Ashland. comments, so I'm betting on them okay. for majority rules. Keep it simple. Sorry, Ashlyn. I don't think Bama's going to make it, my friend. <laughs> All right, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, we'll, we'll go ahead and kick things off for us today. Happy Friday, everybody. I am Melissa Langdale. I'm the president and COO of the Mortgage Collaborative, if we have not met before. Um, and with me, as always, is Rob Christman. And this week's very special guest is Mike Metz, who is the operations manager of BIP Mortgage. Thanks for joining us, Mike. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. Looking forward to it. Absolutely. Um, and for those of you that don't follow us on, on YouTube or our Team C Connect uh, podcast channel, please make sure to do that. Uh, in case you miss a Friday, you can always catch up on episodes there. Um, but before we get going, Mike, for those that don't know VIP Mortgage, can you give kind of a brief overview of what makes you guys unique? Ooh, unique is a fun one, but uh, I think it kind very of all starts with... Very important people. Yes, we're all very important people in AZ, so VIP AZ, just to go along with our acronym chat. Uh, we are retail. We just try to make sure that we do the whole thing right. We take good people and try to do good work and help people out. So, And uh, we also have a lot of crazy people in our company as well. I think that kind of goes along with the industry. So we just kind of embrace it and roll with it. I love it. I love it. Well, um, Mike, I asked you to join us today because you have been doing some very special things um, that I think the world needs to know about. So we, uh, for those of you that weren't- Mortgage uh, related. What? Mor mor mortgage related though, right? Melissa? Yes, mortgage related. Okay. I'm on track, my friend. <laughs> Between the two of us, I, I'm going to keep things on track. Or try. Okay. Or try at least a little bit. Is that okay? So you don't want to talk about the fact that we're all from Arizona? We could talk about the fact that we're all from Arizona, except I don't really claim Arizona. I was only there for a couple of months. Well, Chrisman claims Yuma, which probably most people on the call do not know, but I feel like that's an important factoid to share. 
Where is Yuma? Way southwest. Where's Waldo? Yeah, it's in the southwest. It's let's let's get off Yuma. All right. On on mortgage banking. For, all right, all right. Sake. Mike Mike got us off track then. <laughs> All right, so uh, for those of you that that were not aware, uh, back in December, we um, we did a solution sprint as a part of our 12 days of TMC, and Mike led one of our teams that was tasked with trying to increase day one certainty and annualization without increasing cost, um, which I know is a big challenge for a lot of lenders. Um, and you really dug into things with Fanny and Freddie as a part of that project and would love to hear maybe some of your top takeaways uh, from that, that process. Absolutely. So the project was, like you mentioned, increasing day one certain utilization while not increasing costs. And that's kind of a tricky thing in our industry as we've had a lot of technology become available that helps, but it also increased costs a lot. And then the question is, how much is it actually saving us? Or is it just increasing the borrower experience, which is still a very good thing to do. So I we didn't do great on the project. So it was very, you know, pie in the sky. How do you think real big and revolutionize things? I thought more simple, hey, let's talk to Fannie and Freddie and get their input about how we can do this. So very, you know, brass really? tacks. Mm -hmm. Going to the source. I love it. <laughs> Absolutely. Might as well ask the smart kids. So uh, Fanny and Freddie were both very excited for the dialogue and were great to work with. So we've been working with both of them. And then that kind of evolved into doing presentations at the last TMC conference as well, which we actually have Freddie join Jody, who is a project manager over at Freddie and has just been absolutely fantastic. And then we've had Fanny helping out as well and kind of going over just some of the day one certainty versus the aim and different things we could do, talking stats. For anyone who is unaware, if you have a relationship with Fanny and Freddie, they do have teams that are specifically ready to help you in increasing your day one certainty and aim utilization within the company. And the teams have been fantastic to work with. So both said, hey, we don't know if we can help everybody, but we can help you. And then let's take that and then kind of be able to leverage that into what could help other lenders. So we, I will summarize, if you're going to take one thing out of this, verification of assets, use more of them. And it's one of those things where the industry has kind of evolved and we haven't always done the best job keeping with it. So the capabilities have improved a lot since that started coming out from the old days of VODs. So there's a few different providers that you can use both for Fannie and Freddie, including some TMC partners. So you can find that list as well. And when you use that, it is a huge cost-effective alternative to Equifax because the Equifax costs with work number have just gone way up every year. And as more employers are using them, ADP costs have increased as well. And, you know, there's files where that's costing you 100, 200 bucks, and that's expensive. So verification of assets, you know, check with your provider, but it's going to be more double digits, which is nice to start and low double digits. There's rumors that some people are getting even lower than that, but it is a great way to get one asset, so no earnest money. And two, if you start learning some of the differences between the two of them, it can help. So Freddie, for example, when you have the large deposits, it just backs those out. So you don't have to document the large deposits. Where it's really kind of cool is on top of that is if you have them sync their non their depository accounts, wherever they're getting their pay stub, social security going into it, in about 15% of cases, it'll give you day one certainty on the income as well. So you don't have to go through and start documenting all the different W-2s and pay stubs or even that work number VOE, and it'll take the VVOE as well. So that was kind of just by far the biggest like, whoa, we really need to be using a lot more of that and kind of going through some of those hurdles. Yeah. We um we were I, I've known some lenders that have looked at at that VOD process. Um, are you seeing much success in getting it to go through? With we yeah. have seen some big increases, and some of it is 
education. So even Fannie just very recently came out with a announcement that they are also allowing a 12 month history of rental income. And then that can help flip over into an improve, whereas before you might've been getting a refer. But then everyone thinks, oh, I don't know if I want 12 months history in my file. You know, who knows what Rob did 11 months ago. I'm just trying to get him qualified right now. So with it, you only have to order the 30 or the 60 day. And then it gives you still that 12 month history through the powers of magic direct to the agencies and can do that flip. Um, Before a lot of clients you thought would be uneasy because it's all secure with their bank, but it actually ends up not a lot of borrower objections. Most of them are just as fine providing a secure connection to their bank as they are sending you their bank statements and makes it much easier for, like I said, that account activity or not having to tell them, no, you can't black out your account number. And yes, we need useless page five that shows no other activity. So I've been in a lot of those conversations over my career. <laughs> yes. Um, so, I mean, you know, a, a lot of lenders right now are looking at how do I get further up in the process, right? How do I pull in that VOD or VOE in the pre-approval stage, right? Like the earlier in the process you can get or or immediately at application, the faster the process is for the customer, the easier it is for them, the easier it is for the lender. Um, you know, there are a lot of companies, though, that are a little trepidatious right now around how that's going to change when we get to the point of uh, the the kind of tri-merge credit report moving over to a bi-merge credit report, too. Is there anything that Fannie or Freddie are sharing with you um, in regards to how that's going to impact day one certainty or aim that be helpful for everybody here to know about? Not just yet. There are still, if you want, you can go over to the FHFA talks on the credit score and this change to buy merge and there are open discussions where they're talking about that. At least at this time, it doesn't look like that's going to end up impacting that percentage on day one certainty when you're you setting up with that buy merge. But there's still, of course, a lot of details that they're still working through and they are opening that up to the industry for comments. So you can sign up. I'm sure Team C can help in sending out that link in a future email for people to get engaged and attend the symposiums that they're doing on this and some of those issues that go with it. Yeah, there is, um, for those of you that are interested in, in having a voice at the table, um, there is a, uh, a stakeholder like forum where they hold kind of biweekly meetings and give updates on everything from kind of hummed up, you know, impacts to, it, they just give a lot of, a lot of feedback and, um, and stuff. So any, anybody that uh, is interested, join those. There's a couple hundred mortgage professionals on every single call. So lots and lots of activity um, there. So give, give you some great information. Absolutely. Right. Rob, you've been kind of quiet today. Do you want to take us a different direction? Do you have a question? No, not at all. I have, I have three things I'd like to bring up. First, did you use the word trepidatious? Yeah. Is that, is that a word, trepidatious? She's a wordsmith. It's not. It's a I word if she says it's a word. Yeah. What? Trepidatious. What? trepidatious. It's nervous. <laughs> is that like bodacious? No, anyway. it's not like bodacious. <laughs> no, it's a real word. Okay. Second, second thing I want to bring up was, are our ex employees of TMC allowed to no. to to write in and and uh... no, Tom is banned. <laughs> I mean, you you told me a week or two ago, uh, Melissa, that Tom needs to be dead to me. So oh, I can't that's believe not what I said. I, I can't believe that you're letting him on, uh, letting him comment, and then blatantly advertising Zactus. Oh well, Tracy chimed in. So, yeah. so anyways, so Zactus, there we go. Um, and then the third thing is, Mike, dealing with what you're talking about, I'm going to show, I'm going to exhibit my lack of underwriting acumen. Okay. When you talk about verification of assets, if I have a car, does that, is that lumped into the asset bucket? Include, no, it's not. Like, what about if I've got, raw farmland in you know here in hico texas would that in be... this case the verification of account is 
only dealing with the actual bank account. So the way it works, just as you know, it is new to some people, is it lets you send a link to Rob and say, hey, Rob, instead of sending me your bank statements as a PDF or image or whatever you do, getting creative on your you know kitchen table and counter, taking great pictures of your printed bank statements, because I know you're kind of old school, Rob, then this allows you to just provide your logins for your banks, provide like a one-time pass through of that data. And it provides everything in your bank account from the activity happening, the current balance for whatever that history is, the 30 to 60 days. And then you can do it for multiple accounts. So with that, like it'll do your checking, it'll do savings, it'll do some of the like investment type stuff, but it won't have your car, for example, or your land. So that's all still maybe captured in the loan application, but not through the verification of asset portion. I see. Okay. Then the underwriter looks at my bank statements and, you know, every day, you know, hundred dollars, hundred dollars, hundred dollars. And all of a sudden I get a check for a thousand dollars. What do they do with that information? Do they, do so, they have to go back to me and say, where did this thousand dollars come from? Do I have to, do I have to tell, tell them why each, what each deposit is? What's really nice about this is once you, assuming you have it synced up correctly, which is, you know, a good thing to check and make sure on, it will actually tell you in the AUS findings whether you need to document that large deposit or not. So it'll, with Fannie, it'll document that. Both Fannie and Freddie will document and let you know, hey, you do need to check out this $1,000 deposit. But then from there, as I was mentioning, Freddie will actually back out those funds and say, you know what, Rob still got enough left over in his account that we don't need to worry about that $1,000. And then Fannie will let you know, no, you need to get that documentation and find out why he just got $999. Rob's probably right. pretty shady. Yeah. Well, every, every two months I sell platelets at the, oh. uh, the local blood bank. And so, so something like that would be a, like a regular thing. So they probably wouldn't question that too little, much. A little side gig income. <laughs> I mean, he's got to keep Not up his money so he can it. buy more cat food. Yep, yep. Myrtle's expensive. <laughs> well, the problem is with platelets, you can't drink the week before you uh, sell them. So this is going to be a problem. <laughs> on the wagon for a little bit. Okay. All right. Well, <laughs> And Ed in the chat asked a good question is, are borrowers still hesitant to input their credentials or is that concern fading away? And anecdotally, we found that if you kind of give a heads up to the client, then it does help that client get past that. So, I mean, anytime I think someone comes up and randomly says, oh, hey, send us your bank account user and password, please. You're going to be kind of uh, what's happening here and especially when people are buying a house especially if it's their first time there's already a lot of stuff happening like wait what's an escrow company and who am i what is happening with this earnest money and so that's where if you do that call or that email so we have some templated ones and you just kind of explain what it is we find that a lot of that concern is going away especially with some of the younger generations that are already used to using square and venmo and zell and yeah Hey, here's my info. Let's call it a day. So, Mike, I've, I've heard that I've heard from loan officers, brokers, and so on that there are no easy deals anymore. And I realize that's a little bit of an exaggeration, but as I understand it, every loan has every borrower has hair on them, you know, in terms of things that that just aren't normal. Are you seeing that? And how does does the automation bog down on nearly every loan because of that? I think that it is fair to say that there are more tough loans out there right now. I think that is part of just the macroeconomic trend right now is as we see very limited supply in homes combined with some of the inflationary things we see, everyone is kind of pushed to the edge on where they qualify for stuff these days. You see big increases in consumer spending and consumer debts that kind of factor in on that. And I think there's a lot more people used to call it the bottom of the drawer files. Now I feel like that that's just kind of more the standard and there is a lot more of that complexity as people are kind of pushed to that limit for homes on what they're trying to qualify for. And you know, we do in our market have a lot of that as well. We thankfully have a lot of very good originators that 
handle those. We have one originator, his name's Austin Bates, who is in the top 50 all the time. And he specializes in those very tough, hairy files that others can't get through. And that's where you see people using the tools like this. If you can take off at least some of that complexity and say, you know what, now I don't have to sit there and microanalyze all the assets on top, or if I could get reps and warrants on the income, and now I just have to deal with the collateral side of it that does make it at least more approachable and, hey, let's focus on this part of the problem for the consumer versus documenting the $2,000 birthday check. And for the companies who haven't rolled like day one and so forth, you're saying that Fannie Mae and and, their, and Freddie Mac uh, have have good customer support, good good backup, good information that, that lenders can avail themselves to? They do. They have a very vested interest in seeing this increase. And that was kind of an aha moment for me because, I mean, it makes sense after I think about it, but I never thought about it that way. They don't want to have to come back to us on non-purchases. They're spending money to do those QA audits on these files. And they're not winning any friends when they come back to us and say, hey, take this loan back. So they're spending money to do so and then pissing people off in the process. So they don't want to have to do that. So if we can get more reps and warrants relief, then they don't have to go through and audit that portion of that file. And that's where they did give the preface, hey, if you guys get that rep and warrant relief, don't still put that documentation that it's not asking for in there, because guess what? Now we have to look at it again. I have another naive question. I'm excited do, for it. Do, do non-QM investors or jumbo investors or bond program do they also do they you can can if a loan a borrower comes in can you run the same automation as if it were going to go fannie mae or freddie mac but knowing that it's going to be a you know self-employed borrower non-qm or a jumbo loan i won't speak for all investors because that'd be a very large blanket but most investors at this point will accept that same verification of asset documentation even if they're not going to give you any kind of rep and warrant relief, just if you think about it, it makes their jobs easier and there's less chance for fraud because it's coming right from the banks and it's a very standardized format. So there's not trying to read that super grayscale, terrible lighting, fuzzy text. It's just always the same format, easy to read. Thank you. All right. Can I switch gears a little bit? You can. Us? Okay. Um, so, you know, we just had something released. Um, we, we've talked a lot about the NAR settlement. We spent actually a, a special session when we were in Louisville talking about the NAR settlement and Rob's super excited about this topic. I can Well, know. no, I, but Mike, just so you know, I don't know how often you watch the show a few weeks ago, <clears throat> Melissa went down the path when she's talked about changing years of, of having the talk with her, with her, uh, oh. Wins. So I didn't know if she was going to go down that path all over again or not. So I'm glad, I'm glad, Melissa, you went with the National thanks. Association of Realtors. So yeah, go on. Thanks. Wait, right. so did you have the talk? Oh, Lord have mercy. I'm going to keep this on track. <laughs> all right. Yep. It's happening again, Drew. <laughs> they know that the things that at least make my fa face really, really red as we, we are uh, live with everybody. So uh, okay, NAR settlement, um, you know, it was just announced actually that the appeals court was going to allow the DOJ to reopen an investigation, but that was not on the the existing um, settlement, right? It was on one that was back from 2000, where uh, I think that settlement just called for kind of transparency in, um, in broker commission, like structures and those sort of things to buyers up front. Is that right? So from what I understand, it was back from 2020 and, you know, there was just a lot happening and Chrisman, feel free to talk over me here if you have more idea than I do on this one, but there's lots of complexity to this NAR DOJ. Like I said, we need more acronyms mm -hmm. and eventually they said, Hey, hold up, hold up. Can we at least just focus on this one? And they said, tell you what, let's dive into just this part of it and we'll go home and close up on the rest of this, but they just did it in a letter. They didn't formally close anything. So this is the appeals saying, you know what? The DOJ didn't officially close it. One judge disagrees. The other two said, yeah, if they want to continue looking at things and investigating, they can do so. 
which I think just makes the whole thing even muddier because already, you know, we're starting to get some action from it, but there's still so many lawsuits going on about this. Now you've got it in other states, you've got it in other forms. You now have the DOJ saying, well, I can come back and I can get involved in more of these cases. I think that's just going to make it take even longer before we get clear resolution on, okay, now what? If, if we ever get there, right? I mean, the, yeah. you know, I, I should, should have been a lawyer, although I don't have the, the intellectual horsepower to have been a lawyer, but attorneys, I mean, who, who, you know, attorneys just have to be licking their chops over all of this. And I made the comment yesterday, the day before, that anybody can sue anybody. And with regard, at that point, I was talking about the UWM lawsuit, and I had received a couple emails from Mr. Ishbia uh, about my commentary, which, you know, anyway, that aside, he was he was actually very civil this time. But when you look at any lender, I mean, I'm not going to single out VIP, but you, you look at any body like that, or any lender or organization, you're gonna you're gonna have all kinds of lawsuits that are going on at any one time. I remember, you know, Wells Fargo, City, Chase, Bank of America, U.S. Bank. They have dozens of dozens of lawsuits that are going on at any one time. And and Mike, to your point, this just it further muddies the water and creates uncertainty. And you know the 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 poor the poor home buyer is you know in the middle of this as are lenders who have realtor clients that they're trying to help and they they're looking to answers from and we may not have the answers because they don't exist yet because of the things like what happened today so yeah i agree well and let's get back to the uwm class action lawsuit a little bit because I mean, really, that that whole thing is about them kind of controlling, um, you know, part of the process, right? And it's, it, you know, borrowers are upset or customers are upset because they they didn't feel like they got the best deal that was out there, I, but they they did this at I, they get that many people to come together to say this. I, are there so other implications? Be like, if, if I look at this in the broker channel and how lenders operate across the country, like. If if they're concerned with always getting that best deal, what what's to say that, um, for example, a customer comes to a loan officer and that loan officer says, hey, do you want the lowest payment or do you want the lowest cost, right? That borrower chooses to go down one of those paths and they can have very different implications to that customer, both short and long term, right? Um, you know, I it it. It's just very interesting to me that we're we're at this this point with UWM and and I'm my brain is going to how this affects other other channels and and how we work in general. So I think I'll I'll, I'll go ahead, Mike. I was going to say where I think the UWM one is very high interest to me is, you know, you kind of saw it already with NAR, where as soon as that started making progress. Now you have lawyers say, yes, we'll give up the ambulance chasing for a while. And now we'll go after every state, every realtor company we can find. And then I think now with the UWM, depending upon how that goes, you know, even if they just end up settling out of court, or whatever the case is. Now the question is, are other lawyers going to see that and then find other people who bought homes and said, oh, can we go after this broker? Can we go after this lender and do the same thing? And if you don't have... I don't know what Ishbia's net worth is. Let's call it a couple billion. If Ishbia, if you're watching this, I'm sorry. Um, then it's going to be tougher for lenders to fight those battles if they don't have a few bill laying around. And especially in this market, they don't. One of the things that people, I mean, we can debate this all, all the time. I mean, we, saw, we all saw in 2008, 2010, 2006, you have... The, the UWM is not alone in this. If mm -hmm. I'm yeah. a broker, or if I'm, <laughs> excuse me, I'm all choked up thinking about lunch at coffee cup. Um, <laughs> if I'm a broker, I can tell that, you know, I may tell the borrower, hey, I'm going to shop your loan around. I'm going to get you the best rate, best price. 
the borrower doesn't necessarily know whether the broker's shopping his, his or her loan around or not. And on top of that, the broker may just say that and just send it to UD, U, uh, UWM because they like, you know, they just signed up for UWM's, you know, website makeover or their marketing or their insurance or their great credit report deal, whatever it is. And so the brokers can say, well, yeah, we, I could have gotten an eighth or a quarter better somewhere else, but I wanted to give this borrower, you know, a speedy, efficient, whatever it is, experience. And then on top of that, borrowers aren't confined to one broker. Mm -hmm. I mean, the borrower, I mean, at some point, it's up to the borrower to shop around a little bit. They don't have to call 20 different brokers, brokerages, but, you know, I mean, you, you have part of the blame or not blame, but part of the process is the borrower themselves. They can shop around. You know, I can drive down the street. I don't have to buy gasoline at Chevron when a quarter mile away, there's an Arco station for 20 cents less a gallon. And I'm not going to sue Chevron because they're charging me more than I should be charged. I could have gone up the street to a different gas station. I mean, you may want to try that. <laughs> I, yeah, exactly. I mean, at some point, people have to take responsibility for their actions. Yeah. And they can they can look around, they can shop. And yeah, there are all kinds of studies that talk about how borrowers don't shop or have a minimum amount of shopping, but they're part of this whole equation. So yeah. I, I don't think we should lose sight of that. I'm not, obviously, I, I mean, Matt and I have our disagreements and agreements, and I'm not necessarily siding with UWM in this case, but there are other parties, there are other parties involved. Yeah, Eric actually makes a great point in the in the chat. There there are definitely state, um, you know, uh, certain states that have different kind of duties to the borrower that are required from a um, a broker rather than a kind of um, you know lender uh, as well. So it's it's interesting to consider all of those. Um, okay, we are we are all up at time. We do have one more question though that's in the Q and A from our conversation earlier, Mike. Um, He's asking if you are seeing lenders taking those third-party verifications into their LOS in a digital format, like a JSON file versus a PDF document. The vast know? majority, I'd say, are taking them in as PDFs just for ease of reading. And then most of them have some sort of digital communication of that data so that the AUS and agencies can receive that. But most of them are using the data as a PDF for ease of readability. Awesome. Well, thank you. Um, for those of you that still have questions around UWM, NAR, uh, feel free to reach out to myself. You could probably reach out to Rob too. Uh, and, and we'd be happy to, to continue the conversation offline. This was a great, great conversation, great information. Thank you so much, Mike, for sharing it with us today. And thanks everybody for being here. Happy Friday, and we will see you again next week. Bye, everybody. Bye, everybody.